Today's show is sponsored by Venn by Two Sigma. Venn is an analytics platform developed specifically for capital allocators. It leverages Two Sigma's expertise in research, data science, and technology to deliver modern and intuitive software tools that help clients better manage multi-asset portfolio risk and investment decision-making. From manager due diligence to portfolio optimization to analytics and reporting, Venn by Two Sigma is committed to listening to its clients and making their lives easier. Find out more at venn.twosigma.com. Today's show is also sponsored by Janus Henderson Investors. In an environment where allocators face more questions than answers, having a trusted partner is critical. Janus Henderson Investors is committed to building partnerships with institutional investors based on collaboration, insights, and transparency. With 26 offices and 350 investment professionals worldwide, Janice Henderson has the scale to offer global perspective across equities, fixed income, and alternatives, and the depth to offer local expertise and support for clients. To learn more about partnering with Janice Henderson, visit JaniceHenderson.com slash institutional. Hello. I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can join our mailing list and access premium content at CapitalAllocators.com. Mark Andreessen from A16Z famously proclaimed a decade ago that software is eating the world. His prophecy has proved prescient. Cloud computing enabled the rapid, cost-effective deployment of software, startups flourished, and venture capital returns have been phenomenal. Venture capital is a fascinating investment area whose many days in the sun shine brightest this year. Institutional portfolios with large venture allocations soared to their best year in history. And yet, parts of venture are unique in being both efficient and unactionable. Many believe that Sequoia or Benchmark will produce returns at the top of the pack, but there's not much action anyone can take to participate. This miniseries explores the industry, focusing on some favorites of institutional investors who are still investable to those in the loop. Each has a great differentiated story to share and something to prove. That said, this field moves quickly, so as the disclaimer goes, past accessibility is not a guarantee of future capacity. My guest on the second episode of Venture is Eating the Investment World is Chris Duvos, the founder and managing director of Ahoy Capital, where he invests in early stage venture funds and co-invests alongside his managers. Chris has been a fixture in venture capital for nearly two decades and was an early guest on the show back in 2017. That replay is posted in the feed. Our conversation offers an LP's perspective on the venture landscape, covering the current environment, range of players in the early stage, and how Chris is navigating the landscape. Ventures Eating the Investment World is brought to you by Omni. Omni helps private capital investors track and analyze individual deals while providing comprehensive financial and legal insights across their portfolio. It houses the largest database of investment transactions in the private markets extracted directly from executed agreements, including the legal terms, co-investor details, liquidity preferences, valuations, and round sizes. With that information, investors can make faster investment decisions, benchmark deal terms, understand market trends, and enhance portfolio analytics. Omni's clients include leading venture funds, corporate venture groups, family offices, and endowments, including a number of past guests on the show. You can learn more at omni.fund, that's A-U-M-N-I dot fund. Going into this year, we'd love your help spreading the word about the show. So each week, right in this spot, we're going to give you a fun little reason why. I hope you enjoy the show. And if you do, this week, it might be time to go back to the office and talk to your boss. Now, there'll come a time when you have to make small talk in a way that was protected by virtual work. Well, fear not, we have a suggestion. 
Just before that awkward moment hits in the hallway or the elevator, turn to them and say, you know, I had a chance to listen to the Capital Allocators podcast during the pandemic, and I think you'll really love it. You'll earn a few brownie points for the idea and probably a big bonus next year after they've listened all year long. Thanks so much for spreading the word. Please enjoy my conversation with Chris Duvos. Chris, great to see you. Likewise, it's a pleasure to be on with you again. Somehow it's been four and a half years since you did the show. I don't know how that happened. Why don't we start with just your overview of what's going on in the venture landscape? Oh my gosh. You know, there's this great line in a Fitzgerald story called My Lost City, where he says the tempo of the city had changed sharply. The shows were bigger, the liquor was cheaper, the morals were looser, and the restlessness approached hysteria. (laughs) And that's kind of how I feel today, man. It's like everybody is running at 105 miles an hour, and it's this perfect storm of cheap money, people searching for returns, high profile, outstanding returns, entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial finance just keeps getting more and more interesting. There's just this amazing stuff. And at the top end of the market, we've seen some non-traditional investors, the Tigers and Additions and Global and such come in with huge sums of money and very quick cadence. And that's also contributed to the change in tempo. Every time I talk to somebody whose treadmill set to 12 and they can only run 10, I think of that line, the restlessness has approached hysteria. So in your area of the market on the earlier stage, why don't we unpack some of those things? So the speed that people are moving, what does that look like in terms of the speed of deployment into the earlier stage companies? There's a lot going on, a lot to unpack. So first off, there's the decision time. I love the first round guys. And when they came into the venture business, in 2005, they started tracking time from when they saw a deal to when that deal was done, whether or not they actually did that deal. And I think in 2005, it was 100 days. In 2016 or 17, when they said, man, that has gone from 100 days to 50 days. And 2019, 50 days has gone to 50 hours. I mean, this stuff is just moving so fast. This is what stresses me out. It makes me think of a line Henry McCants, one of the founders of Greylock, said to me, venture works best when capital is expensive and time is cheap. And when that relationship reverses, watch out. That's something that we're certainly in the midst of. There are contra arguments to that right now, but that's one aspect. Maybe the most troubling aspect to me is the time aspect. In terms of my area of the waterfront, it looks like the amount that's being raised in seed deals, like the median, has gone up by about two and a half X. The pre-monies have gone up, again, two and a half X. Everything's just getting pricier. Now, there is a contra argument to that, which is companies are able to get a lot further on a lot less than they were even five years ago. And so as you're investing in these companies, even at the seed stage, and now seed is bifurcated or trifurcated into pre-seed seed, and some people call it mango seed or whatever, and the taxonomy is so fractured as to be almost useless. But what we are seeing is that companies are getting a lot more financing in a lot earlier stage in their lives. And we've seen Greylock and Sequoia and Andreessen raise dedicated seed funds And so the value investor in me is like, holy smokes, like no matter how many things I can articulate that help me sleep at night, the only thing I can really say that makes any sense is this time it's different. Some of the most dangerous words in investing for sure. (laughs) I'm such a pessimist all the time, but what I've realized, particularly over the last couple or three years, is that pessimists sound smart, but optimists make all the money. As I look at the marketplace today, and maybe this is me capitulating, and what's that subtitle of the movie Dr. Strangelove, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, (laughs) I definitely feel like there is so much interesting stuff going on. And the magnitude of total addressable market, the opportunity that startups are targeting, it pains me to say this, but almost does justify some of the valuations that we're seeing in the seed round. There's a whole discussion about late stage and what actual exits are and what the cheap and plentiful capital means for that. But even though I see charts that ring alarm bells in my head, I'm actually relatively sanguine. Hmm. 
because I know when we did the show four years ago, you were raising the alarm bell for a bubble. <laughs> and I'd love to just start there, which is if you looked back at when you were nervous four years ago about valuation, how did you go about participating over those couple of years with this alarm bell ringing in your head that this might all be frothy? I often say I've called seven of the last two recessions. So <laughs> I think there is always money to be made. Even if the market is crazy, there are pockets of opportunity. We've seen that across asset classes, across venture throughout the ages. One of the things that was like a, a great example to me is August Capital, a longtime manager, well-established Sand Hill firm. In what's otherwise a wasteland of 2000 vintages, they put up a monster fund because at the tail end of it, but they had Seagate in there. So there's the take private with a third of their fund, which was amazing. And so I think there's always money to be made. The question is like, how can you make money systemically? And one of the challenges that's really interesting for people in my seat right now is the barriers to raising a fund have gone to zero. And in fact, there are a lot of people who are raising funds almost as a night job. They're still entrepreneurs. Like we, you know, we've seen in the last 15 years, the emergence of the ex-operator as investor in a very profound way. But now we're seeing not ex-operators, but actual operators who have a day job running a company and on the side are investing with AngelList and rolling funds and you can outsource everything. The number of funds have exploded. So Samir over, a, he's running his own shop now, but when he was at First Republic, he used to track the number of funds that were out in the market. And it used to be a thousand. Like that was always the number. Like NVCA, National Venture Capital Association, always said there are about a thousand firms, 1,200 firms. Those were always the numbers. I think Samir at last count found that there are 4,000 people who are actually deploying capital in some sort of fund structure. One thing I found is with a lot of these operators, you end up getting a lot of social reproduction. So like you get the like product manager out of hot tech startup programmer dude who's just looking for other programmers. And that's just a recipe for getting into momentum deals, which, by the way, has worked because capital has been so cheap and plentiful. What I've done is, you know, I'm looking for people who are leveraging ecosystems. So where is it that you can like plug into something that helps you punch above your weight? For me, one articulation of that has been plugging into really interesting university led stuff. You look at the explosion of campus entrepreneurship, both among students and professors. And that led me to things like the E14 fund that sits on top of the MIT Media Lab or the House Fund at Berkeley, where you've got dynamic folks who are mining these rich seams. One thing that's a real challenge is there are a lot of like lone rangers out on the plains like trying to snipe deals. And they're winning by being faster or being able to write bigger checks. And I think that's a general negative. And hopefully I'm trying to avoid some of that hectic deployment of capital with my investments in people who are leveraging ecosystems. Yeah. Across that 4,000 players, you mentioned that a couple of the big brands, you know, Sequoia, Andreessen, Greylock have these seed stage funds. And there is this common belief that there's serial correlation of positive returns with the best venture capitalists. I'm curious in your area of the world in the seed, the early stage, how do you think about the brands deploying capital in a seed stage fund? So it's interesting because as these large funds have started to develop more dedicated seed programs, it's really kind of upended the game because for a certain kind of entrepreneur, they would like a life cycle manager, somebody who can fund their company from inception to the latest rounds. And that's been historically one of the ways in which these firms have competed for deals against the dedicated seed guys. And I've often thought that we've got some good lessons of how these initiatives end because in 2006 and seven, when we saw the first wave of what were then called super angels, you saw a lot of later stage firms or mid-stage firms develop these programs. Several firms had them. I, I won't name some of the firms because one thing that we heard constantly from entrepreneurs in those days is it turns out that the capital is not the scarce resource, it's the time and the engagement. And so surmounting that engagement hurdle, 
I think is one thing that's really challenging. And I think that those efforts collapse under their own almost indifference in those days. Now, I'm not saying any of these new efforts are, are indifference. You know, Sequoia has been doing stuff with scouts for a long time. How do I contextualize that? It's interesting because for me, not being an existing investor in those funds because they don't fit in my strike zone, those aren't something that were part of my opportunity set to start with. If I were an investor in one of those funds, first of all, I'd probably have to do it. And secondly, I would probably gladly do it because I feel like it's some optionality on some interesting outcomes. In venture, what we're doing is we're already buying long-dated, way-out-of-the-money options. And by investing in the seed stage, a lot of these guys, whether they admit it or not, are basically buying option portfolios because I always think there's you can invest pre-Excel or post-Excel, E-X-C-E-L, the, the software package. You can, there are a lot of people who excel at investing pre Excel, but you know, not everybody does. It's, it is a different skill set. It's a different understanding. There's a different level of engagement. And I've always thought that a big benefit of the seed stage is being able to work closely with the entrepreneurs and help set the company's DNA. I'm not sure how much you get with some of these other firms, although you do get access in the case of Andreessen to a large array of services. They've really changed the game, so kudos to them. This is a story that has yet to be told to the conclusion. So on the potential for the other end of that, which are people who may be more long time and experience and less capital, there's this newer universe of solo GPs that maybe have come from other venture capital firms. Maybe some of them are operators as well. And again, like curious how you've canvassed that landscape and thought about the potential for investments. Historically, I personally have focused more on teams because I like people having thought partners. But that said, we've invested in solo GPs at times when they're leveraging a specific ecosystem. So I think specifically of somebody like Ross Fabini at XYZ, who is very tied into a couple of ecosystems, and some of those have articulated themselves pretty nicely, particularly in his first fund. He's built out his team since. But one thing that I've always thought is that the solo GP has a heavier lift than a team. It's you know, There's, I think, an old uh, proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And one thing that I've seen is a lot of these solo GPs have small funds. And I've always wondered, again, I grew up in this era in the early 2000s when people were getting crushed under structure, in structure deals and pay to plays and cram downs and all this stuff. And, you know, we haven't seen a lot of that, but I've always worried that the solo GPs with subscale funds would run up against this constraint if the market ever turned and the later stage guys started getting more aggressive. They'd get crammed down and kicked to common and and all that stuff. And so I've stayed away from those guys almost as a rule, in some cases to my detriment. The other thing that's interesting, a lot of the solo GPs, again, being small and often writing a lot of checks and buying a lot of optionality, I think are having a little bit tougher time today because one thing that is a constant lament today is how expensive talent has gotten. I was just on a call where somebody was talking about mid-level, not even senior engineers at Microsoft are making a million dollars. They're not typically the people who are coming out to go to startups, but I'm hearing a lot of friends here in Palo Alto who work at big tech companies who have very entrepreneurial streaks are extremely happy with the seats that they're in. And so whereas with a seed check, you know, five years ago, you could invest in somebody who was who could basically hire a couple of people and then turn over a couple of cards. The cost of the inputs now are that you're testing a lot tighter a hypothesis because you often can't start to build out that team. You can't hire that first VP of engineering or even some of the early salespeople anymore. You're really just testing the very basic hypothesis of is there a minimum viable product in some cases even, rather than is there a kind of early product market fit. And so I think that's actually increasing the risk. And so a lot of these solo guys end up putting dollars in that are even riskier than they perceive. Another problem with a lot of the solo guys is they end up leading with an entrepreneur-friendly value proposition to get into deals. And I think one of the elements of the entrepreneur-friendly starter kit, as it were, is using safes, simple agreements for future equity, which is a security that was pioneered by Y Combinator. And from an investor's perspective, you know, look, you can get a discount and a cap, but a lot of these are uncapped notes, basically. It used to be 20%. Now we're hearing about a lot of 15% discount saves. And you're just like, holy smokes, you're putting the riskiest dollars that are ever going to go into that company in for a very modest 
return. Now you're on the cap table and you can put more money in later. So maybe you're buying it as an option, but holy smokes, that round should be priced. Like don't kick the pricing can down the road, price that round and get compensated for the risks you're taking for crying out loud. As you're walking through this, I'm hearing this resonance that I saw in the public markets for a long time, which was some form of wage inflation, meaning the engineers are getting paid a million bucks to be at Microsoft. Well, Microsoft has the resources to pay them. And I'm curious, how does that wash its way through this early stage ecosystem and impact how you think about your investments in funds and then therefore their investments in the companies? Yeah, it's interesting because not only is the cost going up and up and up, there's a finite number of great startup people. And by the way, half of them seem to be VCs today. So that's a challenge in itself. And by the way, a lot of great people are getting pulled off to do crypto stuff, which is part of the universe, but an adjacent part. So there's a lot of challenge in assembling the talent that you need. Now, on the other hand, with everything that's going on in terms of delocalization and remote work, that's been outstanding. And we're in the midst of, on the other side of the coin, the great resignation. So like there's a big shuffling of who's where, and I think that's created a lot of opportunity as well. But it is something that I worry about because people are the lifeblood of any startup. Startups don't have a lot of tangible value other than the people that are working on those challenges. So in my own personal investing, it's caused me to double down on people who are working on really interesting and challenging projects because I think it's better to find great talent for people who are working on something on the frontier where you've got a community of dedicated folks who have a burning passion for that as opposed to the nth enterprise SaaS company, which that tends to be more momentum game. Now, a bigger question for me is, I keep coming back to Buffett's equation. Opportunity equals value minus perception. And one thing that Silicon Valley is very good at is creating this recursion between value and perception. When something's perceived to be awesome, then all of a sudden it's super valuable. And then that can get it over the hump. There are a lot of companies where I'm like, wow, that was some BS. But the fact that it had all this buzz got it to a point where you could actually attract enough users to create that value. But value itself, I think, has grown. The intrinsic value of these companies is much greater, I think, than certainly what it was when I started my career 20 years ago because of the types of problems they're trying to solve in the markets that they're engaged in. And so it does make me think that the opportunity, broadly speaking, is greater. And so even though you do have this inflation, in a vacuum, you're like, well, you know, that means the opportunity is less because the return on any asset is the price you pay for it, the capital that it consumes. So, you know, you say, oh, maybe the opportunity is less. But man, like I said, I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. The exits are so much bigger today. The markets are so much bigger. And there's a lot of opportunity, I think, that justifies these bigger valuations, even in the context of this inflation. So when you have this range of former operators, maybe current operators, sole GPs, longstanding seed early stage venture capitalists, larger venture capitalists dipping down. How do you think about the most important skill set that those venture capitalists are bringing to the table at various stages of early stage rounds? The best seed investors across my portfolio seem to have a combination of great entrepreneur sensibility and investor skill set. And what I mean by that is a lot of people tout their recent operating experience and connections, but it's amazing how quickly both of those can become stale. But when you do references on Ross Fabini, people say things like, what I love about Ross is that he's the VP of engineering that I dream of. And I'm like, what do you mean by that? They're like, well, he's the guy who kind of comes in and he helps me think about the challenges. He's both a cheerleader and a personal trainer, and he helps me find you know, great places. And a lot of that is experience and, and network as well. But there's also this great sensibility that's, I think, the missing spark of that. It's kind of subtle and challenging to detect. When you see it, you know it. And so, you know, people like Ross kind of level up. At the same time, Ross has some investing, and, and I don't you know, mean to lean on him too much as an example, but the people I like best think like investors while also thinking like entrepreneurs, because there has been over the last 10, 15 years, this move towards being entrepreneur friendly, which I think a lot of people conflate with being an entrepreneur's yes person. 
there's a difference between being a cheerleader and a personal trainer and also thinking about things that are generally wildly undervalued in venture like portfolio construction. Portfolio construction is an underappreciated yet important art, but a lot of the new entrants just want to buy lottery tickets and then you everybody bows at the altar of power law and you got Angelus putting out reports saying the secret is to invest in more companies because there's a positive correlation between the number of companies you invest in and your return. And it's just like going to the bodega and buying lottery tickets. Another great person who brings together these things is my buddy Sunil Nagara at Ubiquity. He's a very great, thoughtful, entrepreneurial guy who spends one day a week coding, but he also is extremely well-trained having been at Bessemer for a bunch of years. He kind of marries those two sensibilities. As you kind of go into the later stage, it's interesting because one thing that we've seen with Tiger, for example, Tiger doesn't take board seats. They don't care about operations. They're just extremely good at diligence. They're extremely good at prepared mind. A lot of people think that, you know, Tiger's is coming in and writing checks in 48 hours, things they don't know about. No, they've already figured the game out before the question was even asked, before the board was even pulled out of the box. They're moving quickly and they're just providing capital and helping people weaponize balance sheets and then trusting the entrepreneur. And so that's a really interesting kind of skill set that's shaking up the later stage where historically a lot of people, because I think somebody told them at some point LPs love it when you say, you know, your value add, but the reality of it is the best late stage investors have always been good stock pickers. What are the themes that you're most excited about in your portfolios that you're seeing through the companies? Somebody once said to me that there are three sources of sustainable competitive advantage for a startup. You can either have a particularly large market and attack it well, you can have a great management team, or you can have a technological moat. Different investors actually index differently. Like the Sequoia guys love large market. Other people love great management team, which is certainly not mutually exclusive. But I personally really key on technological moat. Because there's just so much capital in the market today. If you're behind, you can just weaponize a balance sheet and leapfrog. Paradoxically, I think the thing that's the biggest change in my career is it's gotten both cheaper and more expensive, paradoxically, to get a startup from inception to exit. Cheaper in the early days because the cost of inputs has gotten so much lower with AWS and you can rent all your infrastructure and and all that stuff. You can build in response to growth rather in advance of it, all that stuff. But then in the later days, it's really important to be able to have a really strong balance sheet to build that unassailable footprint. And we've seen companies win that way. But for me, it's about moat. I'm most interested in things that are on the frontier. So AI and robotics. And I once heard Steve Jurvetson say life is code. So the computational biology stuff. So all the stuff that my guys like Data Collective and Lux, you know, Lux's motto is turning science fiction into science fact. I love that stuff, but it's risky. It's not for everybody. And then obviously crypto has started to change the game, partially because a lot of the best computational minds are getting attracted to crypto projects. And so you want to follow the smart folks. Somebody once said that their strategy is amplifying the weak signals of the distant alpha geek. And crypto isn't a distant signal. It's, you know, it's clamoring and everywhere. And I actually used to poo-poo crypto, partially because I didn't understand it. And in the last like six months, I've really started to understand crypto and its role in the transition to Web3. And that transition to Web3 is probably going to play out over the course of the rest of my career, if not my lifetime. Crypto will be an important part of that. And you just can't ignore it. I'm relatively underinvested in it and a little bit panicked about that. I wonder how it fits into your framework, because almost by definition, crypto Maybe a project is tied to the people, but you're not betting on the people. It's decentralized. You could say that there's a huge TAM, but it's hard to know what it is. And I don't know what the technological moat is. It's certainly a new technology, but everything that's open sourced and decentralized, it's hard. So how are you thinking about participating in that with a framework that almost seems to defy what's happening? This is one that vexes me a little bit because one thing that I always think about is an allocator of capital, you're always testing a joint hypothesis. Is this manager an outstanding manager with a sustainable competitive advantage is hypothesis one. The second is, am I sufficiently aware and educated that I can ascertain that? 
maybe I'm being pedantic about that, but understanding that is a big challenge. Do I know it when I see it? And I feel like the challenge in crypto for somebody like me that's a little bit of an outsider is even that much higher. I was talking to Crypto Utopian here in Palo Alto about this. And I'm like, how do you pick your investments? And he's like, well, I know who the best development talent is. And I just follow them literally on a day-by-day -day basis to the projects that they're going to. And the best projects are attracting the best people. And if you know where the best people are going, you can find your way to the best projects and invest in those. For somebody like me that's several levels removed from this stuff, yeah, I don't even know how I begin to find these people now. You say, well, okay, find a good manager, but I'm still getting educated on what are the traits of a great manager? And there's been so much noise and so little signal because all those trees have been growing to the sky. You're just like, I don't know who's a great all-weather manager. So I don't even know how to begin to think about that. You can say, well, then you should just buy a bunch of options. But then I almost feel like if that's what you're going to do, then just go and index a bunch of coins. I'm kind of curious to ask you about portfolio construction, which you mentioned earlier. When the trees have been growing to the sky, it feels like there's a form of a beta. And people say spray and pray, but that's as long as you're there, you've earned just outsized returns. And maybe there's more risk because of the pricing environment, but you still have the power law dynamics underneath it. How do you think about building a portfolio in this space? I have often thought that venture is a super beta asset class because it is a long dated way out of the money option and options become more valuable with volatility. There's all this finance theory around that. But really what you're counting on, I remember one of the very first meetings I had at Princeton in June of 2001 was with an Israeli venture firm. And one of the people at our table said, we care less about Israel and more about NASDAQ. That like turned on a light bulb because I'm like, Everything eventually has to exit, and either you're going public or you're selling to somebody who's got an inflated or deflated public currency. The amount of beta as a result is huge. But then as I've thought about that more over time, I'm like, you know, there's beta, and these are not revenue or profit or anything. These are just conceptual numbers. When you take something from 1 to 10 or 10 to 100, there's something that's calculable or analyzable to that that will, by definition, have some element of beta to it. The thing that has always attracted me to the seed stage has been that there's no beta in going from zero to one. That's all alpha. That's like the painting on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel where God is reaching out to Adam and there's this tantalizing gap between their fingers and you can almost feel the electricity sparking. And that's alpha. And that's why I've dedicated my career to playing in the space because that's where I think we can really earn our money as allocators rather than just trying to place a bunch of bets and wait for the rising tide to lift all boats. So in the last couple of years, as this velocity of opportunities with venture capitalists or number of funds has picked up, where have you looked back and felt like you made mistakes? Man, I have made so many mistakes and I think about them every day. And it's funny because... I just had my annual meeting of investors the other day and never confuse brains in a bull market, but it's so easy to look smart right now. A lot of my investors were like, holy smokes, the performance is even exceeding our expectations. I'm so delighted with these funds, but they're like, why then was your meeting so downbeat? And I'm like, because I can't help but think about the things that we could have done better. And so one thing that I failed to appreciate is the impact of individual GPs in the seed stage. We were always looking for teams. That was one of the things that drew me to first round. I felt like they had found a way to punch above their weight class. But there's so many great investors like Steve Anderson or Michael Deering who really kind of changed the game. And then you look at some of these, people are calling them solo capitalists now, like Elad Gill or Josh Buckley or those guys who are bringing that kind of sensibility across leading late stage rounds. I mean, that's wild. The other thing that I failed to appreciate was just how large these outcomes could be. One of the formative experiences of my youth in venture was Equal Logic was this company that got acquired by what was then EMC. And it was at that point, like 2002 or 2003, the largest all cash M&A ever to take place. And the two firms that had invested in it had funds that were like so big that even though they each owned 22% of the company, that only returned half their funds. And that like actually changed the trajectory of my career because I put me in this like very rigid mindset that fund size really matters and that size is the enemy of performance 
And there was no way you could generate venture multiples with funds that were over 300, 400 million dollars. And that has been completely disproven. I have been 100% wrong footed on that. And it's because of you know these power law outcomes. If I want to reflect and try to give my 28 year old self a break and say, well, you know, there'll definitely be mean reversion. Money won't be cheap and plentiful forever. But boy, if I could go back and, and tell my young self something, I would say like, look, dude, entrepreneurial finance is going to change radically and become a much bigger part of the financial system and not be a cottage industry anymore. Ecologic sold for a billion three. That's like a B round today of a hot company. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but half my portfolio feels like it could fit in the S&P mid cap 400. And I think that's a permanent thing. And I was late to that boat. So just to not repeat the failure of imagination on the upside, I know you do still have this healthy skepticism of what's going on. What might a correction look like? I'm feeling so optimistic as to not even recognize myself. But one of the things that worried me a lot is that you know you get a downturn and the, the markets freeze. And that's what we saw in 01. You know, I, I remember doing venture in 01, 02, early 03. It was just frozen. And great companies were dying on the vine. I was talking to a cardiologist friend of mine, and he said, you know, every person who's ever died in history has died of the same cause. Blood has stopped flowing to their organs. There are 50 different causes for that, but blood stopped flowing to their major organs. Startups are the same. There are 50 different causes, but they all fail for the same reason. They run out of cash. And we saw a lot of great companies run out of cash. The optimistic thing I'll say is that the beauty of the fund structure is that capital is sticky. When an idea goes bad in the public market, the capital is destroyed. Jeremy Grantham says that the only true risk is the risk of permanent loss of capital. In the venture world, we've got an incredible overhang of capital and a lot of new entrants who are here for good. And even if tomorrow the market went down 40%, you still have an incredible amount of dry powder ready to support the best companies. You know, you go back to like Good Times RIP, the famous Sequoia presentation at the time of the global financial crisis. People are much more cognizant of how to make companies anti-fragile. And that gives me great optimism. It's like, again, that's something I'd, I'd, I'd like to tell my younger self is these companies aren't as fragile as you think they are. But of course, they were back then more fragile and today are much more anti-fragile. And that gives me great hope about the space. So the more I've talked to venture capitalists in the space, the more you start to get excited about opportunities in opposition to that risk of the downside. And I'm curious in the last couple of years, what your process of evaluating a new firm to you looks like and how might that have been different from the past? In the past, you could cast a pretty wide net. And Peter Dolan, who was for a long time the head of private equity at Harvard, one of the first things he said to me when I met him in 2001, he goes, I said, what's the secret to being a good LP? He said, open door policy. He says, meet with everybody because you learn. And so I've historically in my career always had an open door policy. And I moved out to Palo Alto in 2008 and you could fill a day and a night with meetings then. Now, fast forward 13 years I've been here and I could fill my entire lifetime and my children's lifetime with meetings. So what's interesting and exciting and frightening to me is that I've got to come with a much more macro viewpoint when I evaluate managers today because I'm excluding parts of the marketplace because I just don't have the time to focus there. So as an example, back in you know 2005, you could meet with everybody and evaluate them on their own merits with each other. And today I basically have said like, these are the things that I need. I need people who are leveraging ecosystems with some gesture in the direction of technology moat, and I like a team of two to four people. And that really cuts down the universe quite a bit because you just can't boil the ocean anymore just because of the number of people out there. I don't understand, by the way, how people who are building new programs today and they fly out from Ottumwa, Iowa, and go to the Raise Conference, which is one of the big showcases of emerging managers, and make bets. I don't understand how you can do that with any kind of conviction. And for me, conviction drives concentration. I've always tried to run a pretty concentrated portfolio. So you're just taking a rising tide lifts all boats bet. What kind of heuristics do you put on the manager ideas that you share with your peers? 
So one of the things that I love doing is I run a fund and my investors tend to be sophisticated mid-sized endowments who already have some venture portfolio, but are looking for me to help them build their portfolios. So one thing that I'm really proud of is for every dollar that I've put into a fund through our fund, my investors have come in over the top and put in another 50 cents over the 10 years that we've been doing this. And that's super fulfilling and exciting to me. And what I like doing personally, I like finding managers who are on their first institutional fund or their second institutional fund where their first one was, you know, subscale. People who not only have, like I described before, that entrepreneur sensibility. So a little bit of the been there, done that, but also the confidence to be a personal trainer, not a cheerleader, and that investor mentality. So of late, as I think about all the things I've done recently, there is a heavy thread of people who have some investing experience, which I think is less usual. I mean, everybody's got an angel list track record today, but I'm talking like formal investor training. So I love introducing people like I mentioned, you know, Ross Fubini, who spent, you know, years with Kane Adventures, or Sunil Nagaraj, who launched Ubiquity after a 10-year career at Bessemer. Because I think having seen the impact of being an investor, wearing that investor's hat, you know, in the context of a company, that's really important. All right, Chris. Well, I can't let you go without asking a couple of closing questions. Unfortunately, every single one has changed from the last time we did this. So I'm going to go <laughs> through it. the list. What is your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? You know, I'm a pretty big golfer. I played a ton in college and stopped playing once my daughter was born and my game went to crap. But despite my best efforts, my daughter never wanted to pick it up, but my son was kind of into it. And we used to go to the driving range a bunch and I would mix in, you know, those exploding balls every now and again, and that would be a hoot. And when he was old enough, I started taking him out on the course and I partially was doing it as a prophylactic against his devices. You know, these kids live on their devices and getting out on the golf course for nine holes, you know, a couple of hours where they actually can stay focused on one thing and be out among nature and we're out there together. It's a really special experience. So I've been playing a bunch. So my investors don't get bent out of shape. I go to the driving range after work, 4.30 or 5. There's a great one here in Palo Alto. Or I get to play nine holes after work once the East Coast is closed down. But it's so much fun. We're lucky to have a great facility here. And the metaphors of golf and life are, you know, just, I won't even go into them here, but that endless striving. So that's my hobby. What's your most important daily habit? Brushing my teeth. <laughs> it's, I say that because my kids are teens now. My daughter's 21. But the number of times I've said, don't forget to brush your teeth in your life is pretty remarkable. And I told my kids, I think it was David Crosby, the musician, who said the piece of advice I'd give my younger self is take better care of your teeth. What's your biggest pet peeve? The thing that kills me dead, and this is a work one, is when I meet with folks and they tell me about what a good investor they're in because they're in companies A, B, and C. And the number of times that I hear literally in the course of a week, the same people talk about the same five companies. And I'm like, okay, so you're another San Francisco angelist person that snuck 25K into a company that tells me nothing. And the fact that that's your articulation of your value proposition tells me that you're wasting both of our times. Which two people have had the biggest impact on your professional life? So I've got a pair of Davids and one was close. The other was, you know, sometimes people say just one thing that changes your life. And that one's David Swenson. I took his class as an undergrad, talked to him a lot when I was particularly at Princeton, would email every now and again. And even though he and I weren't close by any stretch, he once said something to me that changed my life. He said, investing is about optimizing discomfort. And then the other person is David Salem, who was the founder of TIFF. And I worked with Salem for seven years. What a great unconventional investor. He had a lot of Swenson DNA as well. But Salem told me something that has stuck with me ever since. He says, look, as investors, we don't live in a Newtonian world where force equals mass times acceleration. You make decisions and good decisions have bad outcomes sometimes and bad decisions have good outcomes sometimes. So we exist on this spectrum. There's almost like this bell curve of being right or being wrong. 
And good investors shift that curve in their favor, but will still be sometimes wrong. And then the choice you can make is, do you want to be with the crowd or you want to be alone? And he says, and the second you decide you want to be alone, you bring into play the risk of being wrong and alone, which sometimes is accompanied by career risk. And he said, when I was joining, he said, I want you to invest without any fear of career risk. He says, I want you to come here and invest heroically. I want you to be a courageous investor. And that changed my life and set me on this course where I was like, what's interesting in venture capital today? And that led me to the micro VC movement in the early mid 2000s and some of the most fulfilling both professional and personal relationships and, and returns for investors that I could have dreamed of. And he set me on that course and I'm forever grateful to him for it. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? My dad is this you know greek taxi driver who fashions himself as a philosopher and he says all these things that are cryptic like he says to me he goes my son where you're going i've been and you're just like <laughs> you kind of scratch your head you're just like okay i will tell you that for all the things he said and my mom said it wasn't actually anything they said but what they did and the amount of grit that they lived their lives with that really taught me how to hustle and avoid complacency. We never had any money to speak of. And my mom often had to borrow from her sister to literally to pay the rent. And the amount of grit and hustle and persistence that they demonstrated showed me. And then I went to Andover on a full scholarship and I went to Yale on a full scholarship. And then I saw people who had things handed to them their whole lives. And it just was so shocking to me. And in a perverse way, it was aspirational. I was like, wow, look how easily these people glide through life. And as I've raised my own kids, I've spent a lot of time trying to recreate for them. It's silly because they've grown up in these leafy college towns, Princeton, New Haven, now Palo Alto. But yet I try to kind of give them some like edge and grit because life is not easy. Life is really hard. What I learned from my parents, although they never said it, I never think that they would even think to articulate it is the key to life is if you get knocked down seven times, get up eight. All right, Chris, one more. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? Maybe because of my upbringing, I was a little bit conservative and I wish that I had embraced the zaniness of life earlier in my life and lean into the uncomfortable. And I guess it goes back to Swenson's lesson is optimizing discomfort. I wish I'd, I have often in my life sought comfort, whereas I should have sought discomfort. Chris, always entertaining. Thanks so much for taking the time. Always good fun, man. I love chatting with you, my friend. So keep up the great work. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one and see you next time. An important disclaimer from Janice Henderson Group, PLC. Investing involves risk, including the possible loss of principle and fluctuation of value.